Yeah, hi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Post-lunch sessions are always a difficult one. <laughs> so, um, so I'm here to present uh, uh, innovation in service and maintenance industry from a maintenance provider's perspective. Um, uh, we'll, uh, I'll start with uh, what are the past and present maintenance strategies which have been uh, and are used in the, in the industry for maintenance. Uh, how is digitalization leading us towards predictive maintenance? And uh, uh, how, do you, uh, uh, how do you make such a solution? What are the challenges with some case studies? And how is Kashtum uh, adopting to these new needs? Uh, Kashtum is uh, a service and maintenance partner for uh, mostly oil and gas and shipping industries, but we work with other industries as well. We are based out of Bergen and Harstad, which is up in the north in Norway. Uh, and we have one of the largest uh, electromechanical workshops uh, in the Nordics. Um, we, uh, like I said, we, we provide service and maintenance solutions uh, for all the rotating equipments, electromechanical equipments like motors, generators, um, and transformers, and also condition monitoring for uh, these electromechanical equipments. I'll get to that uh, in detail later. So before, uh, before, before going forward, let's take a review of what kind of maintenance strategies are being used in the industry. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of players who are, who are using reactive maintenance as to uh, also refer to as corrective maintenance, which means that you just run the machine to failure. Now this was, this was being used till 1970s, 1980s, and is still being used for smaller machines. Uh, then we went on to use uh, preventive maintenance, which is calendar-based maintenance. So there are a lot of machines which are stopped every five years. Like in shipping industry, it's very common to, uh, to stop and overhaul machines every five years or every seven years. And now what we are seeing is uh, there is a uh, there are two types of predictive maintenance. One is manual, where uh, you get them, you get the uh, data from sensors, and you have analysts, I'll get to that later, which are analyzing these machines, uh, anal analyzing the machine data to give maintenance recommendation and also what's the condition of the equipment. Uh, and then you have IoT-based predictive maintenance where everything is getting automated. But how do you choose uh, these different kind of maintenance strategies? I mean, you always have a trade-off between unnecessary repair or catastrophic, catastrophic failure. If you put a lot of uh, manpower for one machine or one system, it's, it's possible that there will be a lot of underused labor. And if you don't put a lot of manpower, then it's possible that the machine might break down. So how do you, how do you start uh, doing trade-offs? And, uh, and to do that, you have a, a tool called cost-benefit cost analysis. So you, uh, you look into what kind of investments are necessary, and then you look into what kind of returns you, you get based on that investments in maintenance strategies. Now, getting into the last two parts of the predictive maintenance, which I was uh, mentioning the, in the slides before. Uh, in different industries, you, uh, you call uh, uh, predictive maintenance at different levels. So predictive maintenance, by definition, is basically predicting what kind of maintenance is required on an asset. Right? So, and this can be achieved by using visual inspections. So uh, the, the maintenance engineers or, or the technicians can go to the machine itself, touch it, you know, feel it, hear it, and then predict it, okay, that you need a maintenance in the next one week. So that, so that's a, that, that as well is a kind of predictive maintenance. Then you go to level two, which is instrument inspections. Now you're replacing human sensors with uh, actual sensors, but then you're going machine to machine, collecting data, and then analyzing that data afterwards. Level three is real-time condition monitoring where the sensor data is being analyzed by, uh, let's say, by, a, uh, by, hum by an analyst or an uh, expert or by algorithms. But we are still talking about sensor data from one sensor. Now, the level four where ev which everybody's talking about is where you take sensor data, mix it with a lot of process parameters, ERP system parameters, and then try to predict when do you need maintenance. 
Custom world has been uh, big in level one, two, and three. So, we, so let's uh, look into what kind of uh, this. This was a survey done in 2017 uh, to look into uh, what kind of predictive maintenance. Um, you know, services is being used by the industry. This is from Western Europe, so very relevant for us. Uh, so as you can see, level one, two, and three accounts for 86%, which means that a lot of people are still using visual inspection, uh, instrument-based inspections, and real-time monitoring, which can be uh, expert-based or semi-automated. You know? So there's a big market for us to capture. So a little bit about traditional condition monitoring method for rotating equipments. So uh, like all the, all the rotating equipments have a critical parameter which can be measured called vibration. Uh, and you just by using vibration, almost 70 to 80% of the failures can be predicted. And uh, so as of today, Kashu Muholt monitors around 12,000 machines all over the world. Most of them are from oil and gas and shipping. Uh, 10,000 machines are, uh, like it was mentioned, instrument-based inspections. So either customers go to machine, every machine, collect the data, and send it to us every month or every three months. Or and in, uh, for 2,000 machines, we get the data 24-7-365. Uh, what, what we do then is we have a, a, a group of vibration analysts from level, and, and you have different categories of vibration analysts, which is being certified by ISO. So then the vibration analysts use um, signal processing methods, like fast Fourier transforms, to find out how, uh, what kind of failure patterns are there in the time series data which we are getting. So because in frequency domain, you don't look into uh, a huge chunk of signal with a lot of patterns. In free, once you once you transform the time series data to frequency domain, you have specific peaks at certain frequencies. I mean, I mean imagine you are you're riding a bike, and then uh, there's a bump in, on the tire. Now, after every uh, fixed interval, you'll feel this bump when you're riding. It's very similar. And then what we are doing is, uh, for these uh, vibration uh, 12,000 machines, there is a web-based portal where the customers can go on uh, and check the status of their machines. They also get, they also get it on email as to uh, what is the maintenance recommendation from Kastum Muholt and what's the status of the machine. Just like this, I mean, you, this is something called as reliability dashboard. So, uh, for rotating machines, uh, one of some of the critical problems are unbalance, uh, let's say misalignment. So, in case of pumps, what happens is the motor is driving the pump, right? Now, if the coupling is not proper, then what you will feel is misalignment, and this will lead to a failure. So, just by using, just by measuring vibration and using vibration analysis techniques. Uh, Failure modes like unbalance, misalignment, problem with bearings, and lubrication problems can be can be easily identified, and and uh, and just by using this as well, I mean expert-based predictions, uh, we can also predict as to when is the machine going to fail. Maybe in next one year, next two years, but it is still expert-based. <coughs> so, what are the challenges with this traditional condition monitoring? Uh, the challenges is, first of all, since a lot of uh, the analysis is expert-based, we are uh, this. Uh, this leads to a high variable cost, right? And uh, another problem is, uh, in order to become a vibration analyst, analyst, which is uh, category two, let's say for example, or category three, you need at least three to four years of experience. Now, such a kind of uh, solution is not scalable. Right at the, at the at the amount in which we are getting a lot of data every day, th this solution cannot be scaled. Second is silos. Now, as of today, uh, most of the vibration uh, analysis tools, so to speak, uh, the the data which is collected behind these tools, they are residing in silos, which means that this this real time time series data is not going anywhere out of this. Uh, data warehouse, if you can say. It's not going to the SCADA system or anywhere else, and it's logged in there. 
and there are lack and and as well there's a lack of cloud based solutions so it's it's a, these things are making it difficult for us to auto automate these but the emerging technologies will help us in in automating some of these challenges so let's uh, some of these uh, in solving some of these problems sorry uh, and the the technologies which uh, we are working with in Kashmir Mult are Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, uh, which uh, which covers deep learning, um, neural networks, etc., et and 3D printing. Uh, but today I will I will just concentrate on Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. So I'm, this this is going to the, be the future in next 10 or 20 years. So let's say you are a maintenance manager, you are sitting at home. You suddenly get a message from from one of the machines that okay I'm have uh, I'm I feel that I'm going to have this problem in the next two weeks, and then you will ask you it's it you'll feel like you're chatting with the machine. You will say okay what do I need to do, and then the machine will reply you don't have to do anything. I have scheduled the main me me uh, mechanic and he's going to come in the next week to fix the problem. This was the problem, so th that's where we are going um, in the in the near future. Uh, but how how can uh, how can how can a future like this uh, be solved? Like what is uh, what, how a solution which will solve these problems will look like? So uh, all all the predictive maintenance solutions which we see today are uh, stand, can be standardized like this. So what we do is we we take historical data, which is failure history from ERP systems, CMMS systems. We take reparation history, how often the machine has been maintained. We take machine condition, machine functions, what, what is the machine supposed to do? What are the operating conditions? The operating conditions in North Sea, for example, for an oil vessel will be, sub, will be very different from the operating conditions in Brazil, for example. Right? Uh, what are the operator attributes? You, you look into this historical data and uh, data scientists make models using the historical data. After the models are done, you deploy, uh, you, de uh, de you make deployment and production and connect the live data to, uh, to predict failures. And then uh, all, all the failures, what's the condition of the equipment and what's, what is supposed to be done is, is being shown on a dashboard in an intuitive way. So this there and then based upon Based upon the interface, uh, the the, mech the technicians or maintenance managers can schedule maintenance. So, and that and this whole concept is basically smart maintenance, where you are doing the maintenance only when it is needed, only when it is required. Uh, now, now we we now we have seen that how a standard solution looks like, uh, but what do customers expect out of predictive maintenance? Right, that, that's one of the most important questions. And this was a survey done in 2017, and it shows that 47% of the customers expect uptime improvement, and 16% of the customers expect lifetime extension of aging assets. Because most of the assets in Western Europe, they are around 20 to 30 years old, and they are, uh, they are nearing their end of life cycle. So what most of the operators want is to extend for next five or six or 10 years possible. Right. Then another survey looked into how, okay how many of these assets are actually connected to internet or connected to sensors, and uh, this shows that f for us it's it's a good news that rotating equipment as you can see, uh, yeah here. So almost 25 percent of the assets are uh, of the rotating equipment assets are actually connected to internet, which is uh, good for us. Then we looked into, okay, how big is the market for predictive maintenance in the near future? Because we, we are going to make a, such a solution. So, uh, and this market survey from last year, it shows that by, uh, by 2022, the predictive maintenance market, just the predictive maintenance market will be $11 billion. So now that we know the solution, what are the customer expectations, how big the market is going to be, then we look into, okay, what kind of analytics is possible to make predictive maintenance? So uh, based on what kind of data you have, you can 
provide predictive analytics at three different, uh, predictive maintenance at three different levels. So you can analyze the data to see what is happening and just give what is happening. That's something called as proactive maintenance, right? Then you can analyze this data. Uh, you can use a proactive maintenance and uh, try to predict what is going to happen. Yeah, that's predictive maintenance. And if you know when, uh, when a particular failure is going to happen and what needs to be done to avoid that failure, then what you can provide is prescriptive maintenance, where you are actually telling what needs to be done and what was the failure which was going to occur. Uh, but you don't have to jump directly to prescriptive maintenance, right? So what, what, uh, what we see from experience is we can just start with normal anomaly detection. I mean, when is the machine uh, running normally and when is the machine not running uh, normally? Just red and green traffic light principle, right? Because uh, as others have pointed out, we have a lot of uh, healthy data, right? And very few failure data. So we can just start here. Let's try to predict, okay, when the machine is running normally. After that, once you get, okay, what are the sources and reasons of the failure, what you try to make is uh, you try to improve the model and try to in incorporate some of the failures, right? So then what you have is a model which is giving out, okay, what, that this failure is going to occur, this failure is going to occur, and so on and so forth. Now, after that, if you put uh, in the model now, if you introduce uh, if this failure is going to occur, what is supposed to be done? Basically, maintenance recommendations. Then what you have is remote, uh, remote anomaly detection with solution proposal right here. Right? And once you, once you have reached this level, then it's, it's possible to actually, over a period of time, give a very accurate model for remaining useful lifetime. Because a lot, of, a lot of vendors are actually providing remaining useful lifetime prediction today, but it's not very accurate. Right, and then and this leads to new business models. So you you start providing services, right? You start selling uptime rather than waiting for the machine to break down and getting it in your workshop for people for service providers like us. So uh, this is uh, this is the solution overview for uh, Skywatch, which is our solution for. Uh, predictive maintenance. So we are, we are concentrating here, which is we want to be analytics providers. We have a lot of domain expertise from last 70 years for rotating machines. So based on that, what we have done is we have made uh, machine learning models which can predict when, is the rotating, when, can, when will the rotating, rotating machine fail, basically. And we have partnered with, we have partnered with data warehousing uh, Solution, solution providers like DN, DNVGL, Veracity. Uh, so, and this is helping us in getting new uh, pilots. Um, j just to summarize, so what is happening here is uh, you have different data sources, and then uh, you have API-based secure transfer, for example, to the, uh, uh, to the data warehouse, for example, here. And then from the data warehouse, analytics providers like Kastumu Holt pull in the data, and then give maintenance recommendation and uh, failure prediction. Uh, so this is one of the pilot projects which we are working on. Uh, uh, the problem was basically um, you have export compressors uh, in offshore, which are actually which are sending out, let's say, the gas which is coming out from the well. Uh, the export compressors are compressing the gas and, give, and sending it to onshore you know, so that it can go from, let's say, Norway to England and rest of the Europe. Now, imagine if, uh, if the export compressor breaks, how big is the downtime, right? The gas will not be exported out of the, out of the oil, oil, oil platform, right? So what we did was we analyzed last seven years of equipment data, and we combined this with domain expertise uh, in custom world as well as the oil and gas uh, uh, operator here. And now uh, what we are making is we are making an anomaly detection for these compressor trains. Because if, if they just know that if, if, if the compressor train is going to, be, uh, going to break in next one month or two months, that will help them in scheduling, scheduling or schedule, scheduling the maintenance to find out what, was, what is the problem basically. Because we are not telling them what is the problem. We are just telling them that there might be a problem. And, that, and uh, 
that kind of detect uh, that kind of prediction will help them uh, in saving around 10 to 20 million dollars i mean just this one downtime which occurred uh, in this oil platform it costed them around 10 to 20 million dollars because it's such a critical equipment right so uh, moving on to an and and the problem which uh, th there was some challenges which we faced here and first and uh, one of the challenges which has been uh, mentioned by most of the speakers here is the failure data so we had just two occurrences of failures from seven years of failure data and we are looking at six machine trains i mean I imagine how how less uh, failure data we are talking about uh, and another solution is uh, which we are working on uh, now, we started this year, is uh, predictive maintenance of converters in wind turbines. So what converters do basically is the wind turbines, they generate, uh, they generate electricity, right, from, from, the, from wind. But the electric, electric power which is being generated has different frequency than what grid supports. So the grid supports 50 hertz, right? So converters are being used to change this frequency. Uh, in a very, uh, if I can explain it, explain it simply. But uh, the analysis from last five years have showed that converters are the main source of uh, downtime and uh, problems for wind, wind turbine uh, operators. So what we are uh, looking into now is uh, making a solution right from sensor to uh, the maintenance recommendation and failure prediction platform which can be made for these wind turbines. This is a research and development project uh, which is being funded by EU. So, and we have already got some interesting insights like uh, very specific, very specific, uh, 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 how do you say, parameters which, which need to be measured in order to predict the failure. Because it's, uh, you cannot just uh, stream all the data which is possible and then start Analyzing it's it's important to involve domain expertise. Uh, I'll not get into that. This has been explained by a lot of speakers here. That if you have label data, you use supervised learning, and if you don't have label data, it is unsupervised learning. But the decision tree uh, simplifies it a lot. But what what are the challenges in making such kind of solution? Right. So very quick, uh, so first and foremost challenge is, according to, survey, uh, according to a survey done in 2016 and 17, 50% of the people say that uh, they see security as a big problem, cybersecurity. Uh, like we are talking about that most, most of the, most of the uh, hardware and software solutions would be, should be cloud-based, right, or cloud-supported. But the, okay, what about uh, cybersecurity, right? The, Second problem is immature and low performing technology. So a lot of these technologies are in uh, are not mature enough, like AR, VR, we are talking about, right? So unsupervised learning, which uh, has been talked about in this uh, in this summit. Uh, connecting legacy systems to cloud applications. Now there's a huge fleet of assets which is not supported by internet, right? Which is not connected to the internet. So 30% say that this is a big problem for them because this requires huge investment. And lack of in-house skills. Since we are moving towards more and more data-driven organizations and data-driven maintenance, they need people who understand and work with data. Now, if I take a specific example, so let's say an oil rig which is in the middle of nowhere, right? So then uh, you have restrictions on how much data can be sent from the oil rig every day, right? And uh, in addition, uh, how much data that can be, like, there is no limit on how much data can be generated, but if the data is just being generated and is not being sent, then we have a problem, right? Another uh, uh, challenge which, uh, which the industry is facing is, uh, is what kind of sensor should be, should be chosen? Wired sensor, wireless sensor, or should we just take a sensor and go around the oil rig or ship to, to get the data, right? And, uh, we feel that we can use a criti machine criticality to solve this problem. So if the machine is not, uh, if the machine is highly critical, then I, I don't think we have the technology to, uh, to support, let's say, 10,000 10, samples every second. If you're talking about vibration, we have 20,000 samples every second, right? Such kind of 
uh, such kind of connectivity is not available in ships or drilling rigs, for example, right? So what kind of what are the solutions to these problems? Is first of all, we need to combine domain expertise with machine learning, and not just let uh, data scientists do their job, right? Second is break the silos, make everything uh, uh, cloud not cloud-based, but at least connected to APIs, so that it's easy to uh, easy to easy to get access to the data and analyze it. Working with regulatory authorities to establish standards. Now, when condition monitoring came out, customer world worked with the NVGL in order to establish, establish some of the standards which are needed for, for condition monitoring. So, and it's necessary that regulatory authorities like the NVGL uh, try to standardize, let's say, data quality or algorithms which are, which are needed in this industry. Uh, establish partners, uh, partnerships in ecosystem. We don't need to do everything uh, by ourselves. I mean, there, there, are, uh, there are experts uh, for each part of uh, digital transformation in predictive maintenance. I'll, I'll get to that in, in, in a minute. Let's see. Yeah. So this is the I IoT ecosystem as of today. So you have sensors, and you have sensor manufacturers here. Then if you, if you go up, up the food chain, then you have the networking connectivity providers. You have the platforms which are getting all this data and making it available on platform. Uh, analytics sits on top of it, and then you have apps which are uh, using the analytics. Another, uh, another solution is move analytics near the data. A lot of people have talked about edge analytics here. If we see ships, uh, ships and oil rigs, mostly, they, uh, there, there is a huge problem of network connectivity. And uh, edge computing can solve it. By deploying algorithms at the edge level, you, you control how much data is being sent and how much data is being processed near the sensors. So this is what we are doing in Kashmir World. So, uh, we were established in 1945. We, are work we were working with reactive maintenance. We were hoping that, okay, customers send a lot of machines to us when they break down. It was good for us. But then uh, new strategies came in, predictive maintenance. We started with condition-based condition -based maintenance in 1997. And as of today, we have 12,000 machines. So it's important to come up with new business models, uh, adapt new technology, get into new markets. Now we're getting into wind. We have never worked with wind industry before. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, com compete on price and efficiency. So when, when a new product comes out, it's, it's, we are just comp competing on the technology. But then when it gets mature, it, we start competing just on price. So we are still seeing the uh, initial phases of predictive maintenance, I believe. So the future is going to be exciting. Yep, thanks a lot. <laughs>